<laughs> you are here. <laughs> and you are here. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Cameron Maris, and we're Group 5 uh, representing Westinghouse. I'm here with Grant, Scott, Bryce, and Ashley. And our project focuses on the voting pattern optimization for a three loop Westinghouse PWR with an interest in high enriched fuel. So, the focus of our project is really to take a typical reload that is done for three loop PWRs for Westinghouse and kind of match a design that typically goes on from Westinghouse. Um, as we can see here, this is a core design for cycle 25 of our placeholder power plant called Rolling Plains 1, which is, um, is a placeholder for a real plant in the current fleet. And so this cycle 25 was kind of our, our guideline for our first goal, which is to create a, another reload pattern, um, cycle 26, that meets all those safety requirements and all the operational requirements. Now, in addition to that, our second goal was to create a high enriched loading pattern above the regulated 4.95% limit in order to compare the economics between the two. Now, of course, the safety analysis has to be done for these high enriched assemblies, and there's some more considerations that come with that increase in enrichment. And additionally, um, with our safety and operational um, constraints that are analyzed with our code, we added uh, analysis for thermal hydraulics using Westinghouse's Viper W code. And this will be applied to all of our designs in order to ensure safety. So you can see here a list of our uh, computational methods used. Um, primarily, we used uh, ANC 9, the uh, Westinghouse's core design code. That's uh, advanced nodal code uh, 9. It is a three-dimensional nodal code using a um, 2D group, uh, two energy uh, group diffusion. And so we also want to, you know, analyze the thermohydraulics, like Cameron said. And uh, ANC9 does come with a simple thermohydraulic package, um, but it is only one-dimensional and does not analyze transients. And so in order to get our thermohydraulic data, we used a Viper W on Westinghouse's um, thermohydraulics code. And so using that, we got our um, minimum departure from nuclear boiling ratios and uh, critical power ratios, as well as uh, fuel and clad temperatures. And we also used an uh, automation uh, bash script. Um, a big part of the project was taking our loading patterns out to equilibrium. And so that involved running many different uh, iterations that we didn't, uh, that was not time effective to make each one manually. So we made a um, retrofitted, a pre made automation uh, script for, um, for taking those to equilibrium. And so this is an overview of the uh, ANC uh, 9. Uh, system, um, part of the Nexus, part of the Nexus system, and what we primarily worked on was the uh, front end here with um, the user input file. I'm um, using pre-generated cross-section data um, to use the ANC model and data to get our results. And so you can see there the Nexus system that generates the cross sections. Um, the Alpha system works in the automation of the cross-section generation, and the Paragon is for the generation of nuclear data, like a uh, pin, everything. So the uh, pin power. And so the, um, all the cross-section data were, all the cross-sections were already made for us, and the focus of our project was in using those cross-sections to optimize the loading pattern. And so this is an overview of the solution, message, me solution methods, ANC goes through, um, how it actually solves, um, solves for the core with what we give it. You can see a feedback iteration there, so if it doesn't converge, it goes through the, uh, runs through the uh, feedbacks from uh, temperature, uh, temperature of the fuel and moderator and even uh, xenon generation. And so we have uh, many different uh, constraints we're working with when we actually make our loading patterns. Uh, for we're, we're making two different loaded patterns, the low enriched and the high enriched. For the low enriched, um, we cannot exceed um, 65 feet assemblies in the core. And for the high enriched, we want to keep it under 69 feet assemblies. Um, above 69, and we start to approach um, loading half of the core with uh, feeds, and we don't want to do that. It's just not going to be economically viable, even if it is, uh, doesn't meet the limits. So, um, and for the cycle length, we want to exceed 500 estimated full power days um, for the um, low enrich, and um, but that's that's our target estimate um, for that's our target for EFPD is about 500, and for the high enrich, the the interest in seeing is seeing how far we can take the cycle um, with using the high enrich fuel, and so our limit um, is just above 500 estimated full power days. It wouldn't be effective or anything lower than that. 
And so we have energy requirements and a boron concentration. We want to um, make our core so that it um, reaches a, runs out of reactivity right at the end with 10 ppm of boron um, and with the end of cycle at 21,000 megawatt days per MTU of burn up um, for the low enriched and for the high enriched. We also want to be at 10 ppm at the end of core, but that will be anywhere um, above 21,000 megawatt days per MTU of burn up. So for the peaking factors, we want to stay below 1.5 um, with um, all, all rods out for both cases, um, low enriched and high enriched. And also for the high enriched, um, for the, and for the, um, Rotted, for the rotted peaking factors that the, with the rods inserted to the rod insertion limit, for both cases, we want to keep that below 1.55 in case the inserting rods tends to expand or tends to push out the um, flux distribution anymore in case that makes, us, uh, makes the uh, peaking factors go up any. And so for moderate temperature coefficient, it has to be negative um, throughout the cycle, starting at hot zero power. If it's negative at hot zero power, then it should be uh, negative um, at all cases. And the shutdown margin above, above uh, anywhere above 1700 uh, PCM reactivity and burn up um, cannot exceed 62,000 megawatt days per uh, MTU for the low enriched and for the high enriched. Of course, we can take a, we can take that burn up limit higher with the high enriched to uh, 70,000. And so. When designing our loading patterns, we have many different things we want to consider to make sure as we're making it that it's going to be economically viable, such as um, energy requirements. We want to make sure it gets to the end of cycle um, and can, uh, is loaded in a way that such it's, it's energetic enough to make it to the end of cycle. Um, the, we want to consider core symmetry definitely too. That's not something that we were initially considering, um, but it's definitely something that, um, that, we, that we quickly uh, realized is going to be pivotal to making an effective core. The more symmetric it is, it evens your, um, evens your peaking factors and helps with, uh, helps with burn up limits. And so the, the way we define the core is we define the quarter core and ANC makes that uh, rotationally symmetric. So it's going to be quarter core symmetric. Within that, we can have eighth core symmetry to where that um, that quarter core is symmetric across the uh, across the axis in that quarter. So that and that, uh, that that's definitely beneficial too to have eighth core symmetry, which is what we uh, which is what we went for. We're designing a low leakage pattern using the um, like going through a L three P um, low leakage pattern with um, with our most burnt fuel towards the periphery, as you'll see in our designs, and um, most of our and all of our uh, fresh fuel um, towards the center um, with a make sure the burnt fuels at the periphery to minimize neutron leakage, maximize economy, minimize uh, unnecessary radiation of the reactor pressure vessel. Um, the burnable absorbers we're using are IFBA, integrated fuel burnable absorber, as well as uh, gadolinia. Um, the IFBA coated on the outside, it will burn up after about 5,000 um, megawatt days per MTU. Um, but the gadolinia is distributed throughout, um, throughout the actual fuel, and so that it will um, last longer um, through the It'll last a little longer through the core cycle, and the gadolinium actually will displace um, fuel, and but the IFBA will not. But so there's there's pros and cons with both, and the shuffling scheme is really the kind of one of the biggest parts of this project. That's what we define is the shuffling scheme to um, bring this to equilibrium to optimize the loading pattern. Um, is when we choose where to shuffle our assemblies from. Um, we can either rotate or translate them. So when we have our quarter core, if we when we go to the next cycle, if we take an assembly and move it to somewhere else within the same quarter core, that's just a translation. But what we want to do is uh, try to rotate as much as we can, take, a, take an assembly from across the core so that it will have a different corner facing the center, so that we'll have a different corner getting burnt um, throughout, the, throughout the cycle. And that's, that's what's really pivotal in, uh, pivotal in making sure we reach our, um, making sure we stay below the burn-up limits. Uh, burn-up limit was a, um, a, one of the you know, limiting conditions in, in, as we were designing our cores. And so, and so designing really good translations really helps, helps in the project. Mm -hmm. So for our analysis, um, <coughs> we started uh, with sort of an initial design given to us by Westinghouse. Um, it was kind of an initial test. It's, it's hard to see on the screen. But uh, it's obviously asymmetric with 7% enriched uh, feed assemblies, which are far above our limit starting to design our low enriched core. And this was kind of the starting place um, where we worked from. And as we moved through, there was, um, what did I do? There was uh, a movement towards, it's going right away. Um, starting that L3P design with having the shuffleboard in the middle and sort of the ring of fire with your burn fuel in the periphery. 
And so through our design process, we had over 750 different iterations to complete the low enriched and the high enriched designs. And one of the things and challenges we quickly realized is that for a 65 feed or 69 feed reload, you're going to have a center fresh assembly. And so in this case, this fresh assembly is a matter, is, is somewhat of a problem. What do you do with it? Do you um, throw it out of the core after each cycle and reload it fresh every time, or do you keep it in there? And so we decided that it would be economically viable to burn it a second time, and that introduces a, each loading pattern having two forms, a loading pattern A and a loading pattern B. So the first being 65 or 69, and the second being 64 or 68. And so going to equilibrium, we alternate these patterns until they converge um, between one cycle to the next. And once we're at that point, we can conduct safety and operational analysis. So some of our additional designs that we worked through um, started to get where we wanted it to be. We had the ring of fire, and we got our enrichments down and burnable absorbers where they needed to be to limit peaking. And this is a, one of our early successful designs. Um, s one of the most important parts that is hard to show, as Scott mentioned, is the shuffling scheme. So that was one of the most important things, realizing how to burn each assembly evenly over multiple cycles. And this is our final low enriched uh, pattern design, which we can see on the next slide. So we ended up with a 4.59 enriched um, a set, uh, first loading pattern. Um, this is the LPA and the LPB design. We can see that center assembly in the LPB design is now a once burned. And so this was taken out to equilibrium, and we found that it, it successfully met our criteria. And then from there, we bumped the enrichment up to 5.0, which is just above that limit. Um, the, the, uh, from the, from the face of it, the design looks very similar in terms of that L3P design, but the shuffling scheme changed quite a bit between the two in order to really push down um, any, any of those spots where we had pins reaching the limit. And finally, our, uh, our second high enriched design was able to get up to 5.16% um, enriched, and we actually added a fuel assembly um, to each of the quarters, so that pushed our first high enriched from the 65-64 combination to the 69-68 combination. And this is really where we saw our biggest gains. And finally, we had our, have our latest test, which um, sees an increase in enrichment in four assemblies in the core. But unfortunately, we could not get the peaking below 1.5. And so that was the extent of our analysis for our third high enriched. Um, but all the others met everything and worked well. Okay, so these are some of the results of the three working cases we have. And this uh, plot here shows the limit above in red of 1.5 for the uh, this is unrotted peaking factors. Um, the, uh, the green one here was the highest enriched we had. And uh, to really get that to work, um, had to introduce a lot of uh, vertical absorbers into it. And that's evident by the, uh, the less um, steep curve right here uh, going up. <clears throat> Um, yeah. uh, the next plot is just the uh, peaking factors with the rods inserted to the rod insertion limits. Uh, same idea, um, have a lot more margin to play with than that one, so we had a much harder time with the unrotted uh, peaking factors. Uh, next chart shows the moderator temperature coefficient. It's um, negative in each case, as, we, as is desirable. Uh, they just follow enrichment. Um, they are most positive at the beginning due to all the boron in the uh, system here. Um, and the next plot that I have for you is the boron concentration. And as expected, they same trend as the, uh, the MTC as well. Um, one thing to note with each of these, um, as the enrichment goes up, so does the cycle length, which is what we were really aiming for, um, economically speaking. And so these are summaries of each of the charts, uh, um, as you can see, they met all the design constraints that Scott mentioned in the uh, beginning of the presentation. <clears throat> and I mentioned that uh, cycle length was increased as the enrichment was increased for each of the three loading patterns we have. And just to put a number on that, the uh, goal for the low enrich was 500 days. We got it to 500, almost 501. Uh, 571 for the first high enrich that we were able to accomplish. And then the last one, 
we're able to get to 642 uh, EFPD. So uh, we've shown that we can develop a, um, a series of high enriched loading patterns that are effective and meet our limits. And uh, our project really focuses more on the practicality of it. So that's why we need to explore the economics of it. Our low enriched lo uh, loading pattern, um, overall fuel cycle costs of about $70 million, uh, with our most significant expenditures being uh, enrichment and or costs. Uh, it's pretty standard for a 65 feed Westinghouse three loop PWR. Um, moving forward with a low enriched design would likely entail uh, optimizations of uh, assembly placement and um, trying to get enrichment down just to make sure we're saving as much money as possible. Uh, <coughs> Right now, our uh, levelized cost is about $7 per megawatt. Um, our first high enrich pattern, uh, naturally, increasing enrichment entails a increase in ore cost and enrichment cost. Uh, and taking that into account, our, we, we only increased by a $5 million for a fuel cycle cost. <laughs> But um, that extra 70 effective full power days means that our levelized cost is about the same. Initially, this doesn't look super appealing. Uh, why would I pay more for the, the same price per? The whole point in buying in bulk is to save money. But um, if you extend this practice over a handful of cycles, you end up seeing an increase in um, uh, I lost the word. <laughs> you end up uh, seeing a high return, basically, uh, compared to what uh, the, the fuel cost you're putting in. Our second high enriched loading pattern uh, naturally includes a higher uh, ore cost and a higher enrichment cost. However, optimizations to the actual uh, distribution within the assembly are um, adjustments to our blanket region enri 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 enrichment means that um, we end up with that, uh, that extra 70 effective full power days, but only an additional $3 million to our fuel cycle cost. And uh, that also means that our, we see a significant reduction in our um, levelized cost. It's about a dollar and a half, or well, a dollar less. Uh, we also start pushing towards that two-year cycle length, which has some interesting implications. Um, one being the, uh, we can stagger reloads. Additionally, we're spending more of our finite plant lifetime operating, which means you're making more money for your initial first cost. And uh, grid stability, having energy when you need it. Um, they're also, there might be some initial hidden costs that were beyond the scope of our uh, our project, such as material costs and ensuring our higher peak burn-up limit is safe. Additionally, storage and the like needs to be re-looked at and adjusted. And um, there might be an additional uh, lobbying cost, just getting that, that limit raised. So after we finished our loading pattern development that met all of our project constraints, we had to do a thermal hydraulic analysis on our core. And we did this using um, a subchannel code that's called Viper W. We analyzed our core under nominal conditions and then we went on to analyze three different transient cases. Here you can see our minimum DNBR uh, axially for our nominal case, the minimum was 3.267, which you can see is in the axial range of 126.6 to 130 inches. And that is well above the limit for DNBR that we were given of 1.3.
The first transient case that we analyzed was a flow reduction uh, due to a coast down after uh, an RCP trip. So on the right, you can see we have our flow pressure and power ratios compared to their initial conditions. And these are the values that we use to simulate the transient in Viper W. On the left, you can see the plot of our minimum DNB ratios over the time of the transient. For the flow reduction, our minimum DNBR occurred at 3.5 seconds, and that value was 2.796. The second transient case that we analyzed was a power rise due to a bank withdraw at power, and that minimum DNBR ended up being at a value of 2.503. That occurred at 52 seconds near the end of the, end of the transient. As, and as you can see, that is still well above our safety limit. Finally, the last transient that we analyzed was a pressure reduction. And that ended up being our most limiting transient. Our minimum DNBR for that transient was 2.386. And that occurred at a time of 750 seconds. Finally, some of the future work that we could see being done with this project is uh, further <coughs> analyzation for thermal hydraulics using Viper and continuing to optimize that loading pattern and raising enrichment to hopefully get to a full 24 month cycle length. All right. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Thank you, questions? Yes. I saw the plot of the MTC. With, uh, so is there a, um, a constraint on the lowest value at the end of cycle, for example? You know, the negative end of um, For our project constraints, we were not given a, a low end value. We just wanted to maintain um, a negative value for the length of the cycle. Yeah, that's something that we definitely could look at for further transient analysis. Maybe a comment from Westinghouse? Comment. <laughs> 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 Any other question? Any question for this group? All right. Let us thank you then. I guess this is, the, uh, this is the loading pattern hour right here. So uh, my name is Josh. This is uh, Ulrich. We have Joey, Don, and James down here. Um, for our uh, design project, we did a PWR cycle extension using PRISM. So it's stuck. <laughs> Spinning pinwheel <laughs> doom. Good luck on that exam. <laughs> yes. Let me close up some of the old ones. That might be the problem. Part of the problem there. Right room. That's not good. Okay, which one's yours? Uh, the PWR right there. This one? Yes, sir. All right, I don't know what's going on. We're going to try this. <laughs> this 
describe one of the ones that's not. They're all giving me pinwheels. A second. Okay, we'll do this. Just give it a second. It's just. Sorry, it's just got to reboot. Yeah. I don't have any jokes. <laughs> I'm just can't. I just can't wait to talk to talk with uh, John later about my awesome Macintosh. Yeah. It's still outperforming Lisa's computer, which is why we're using it. <laughs> happen in about as much time as it takes me to walk to my car. <laughs> Group five or six? six. So let's try this again, eh? Yeah. Yeah. And of course all this is going to be on the internet so they can... <laughs> All right, I'm going to get the pinwheel of death again. Yeah, okay, that. All right, there we go. Take two. Here we go. <laughs> all right, so uh, first of all, we want to go over the motivations behind our uh, design project. As with any loading pattern, uh, we want to minimize the fuel cost while still delivering the required performance uh, levels. For our project specifically, uh, we want to determine, determine the economic feasibility of extending the current cycle length as well as with a, a higher enriched fuel cycle. Um, along with the cycle length, we wanted to take into account uh, the acceptable values of peaking factors, maximum burn-up, and our boron concentrations. Uh, overall for our project was broken down into three components, the first of which was uh, to determine the maximum cycle length. Uh, with the standard enrichments of up to a 4.95 percent enrichment, the the second part was to determine or to design a two-year cycle with higher enriched fuel of up to 6.95 percent enrichment, um, and the third component of that we performed the an economic analysis of these loading patterns. Uh, these loading patterns were designed for the uh, Sharon Harris Unit One just down the road from here. Uh, with uh, 157 fuel assemblies in the core. Um, our fuel assemblies, we used a uranium-235 fuel with enrichment from 4% up to the 6.95%, uh, along with a burnable absorber of uh, gadolinia from uh, 2 to 8%. Um, as you can see here, this is a beautiful plant just down the road here. Our computational tools that we use throughout this design process uh, included CASMO, which is our cross-section library um, producer. Um, these were provided to us by Framatome with their proprietary CASMO 3 uh, version. Uh, from there, uh, we used those cross-sections to uh, run through PRISM, which was our um, nodal diffusion code. Uh, and once we determined the loading pattern, we then would run that through 
our economic analysis code uh, called Fuel RQ. So our overall design process was based off of a uh, low leakage loading pattern. Uh, we wanted no fresh fuel on the core assembly uh, to ensure our neutron economy was uh, sufficient um, and also to control the uh, peaking powers, uh, the, excuse me, peaking factors. Um, we used uh, the Gatalinia to control our uh, peaking along with the uh, boron concentrations. So once we received at the top up here, once we received the cross-section files, we would then use those to build our individual fuel assemblies. Uh, once we determine our fuel assemblies for each cycle, we would then create our loading pattern and insert that into PRISM. So PRISM would then output for us, amongst numerous other things, our uh, peaking factors of F delta H and FQ, uh, along with burn up and cycle length. If those limitations had not been met, we would then go back in on, on either redesign our fuel assemblies or an, and or our loading patterns. Um, we did this numerous times until our limits were met and w then which we could perform our economic analysis. Uh, for the di design constraints, I'll hand it off to Oleg. So in terms of the design constraints, the important thing to uh, recall is that uh, Sharon Harris is obviously an operating plant with an operating design, so as long as we meet these constraints, then our uh, thermal hydraulic factors should be met. We shouldn't have any problems with those. Um, so our uh, peaking factor limit was 1.596 for the uh, F delta H and the overall peaking factor 2.41. Um, and our burn up limit is 62 gigawatt days per metric ton uranium. Um, so one thing about that is uh, the burn-up limit is set by the fuel integrity, which is determined by um, the fuel vendor. So in our case, we're working with Framatome. So that was a given constraint for us. Um, boron concentration limit of 1,600 ppm, um, which we'll get into this a little bit later, but that's not a hard limit. Um, that has more to do with um, the uh, chemistry of the coolant um, because one of our designs actually goes a little bit above that, um, but we calculated the moderator temperature coefficient and it is still sufficiently negative. Um, and uh, feed assemblies, we could uh, have a maximum of 79 fresh feed uh, assemblies in the core um, with an enrichment of 4.95% for our cycle extension and a limit of 6.95% um, with our uh, high enriched um, design with a goal of 686 effective full power days being the two year um, cycle design. So this is our starting point. Um, this was the loading pattern that uh, Framatome provided to us. Um, so as you can see in this uh, loading pattern, there are 64 fresh fuel assemblies, uh, 65 once burned and 28 twice burned. So there's a significant amount of burnt fuel in the core, um, along with multiple GAD patterns, as we already mentioned, going up to 8%. And this had a, uh, ran for 496 effective full power days. So we were looking to extend that design. So you can kind of see the cycle behavior over time. Um, you can see the peaking factors, and you kind of see a point where it peaks out towards uh, 300 uh, full power days, and that's due to the burnout of gadolinium um, within the core. So the high enriched gadolinium kind of burns out at that point, which is why you get that peak out there. Um, so you can see the burn up stays beneath the uh, um, limits and all of our all of the initial limits are met. Um, and then running a fuel RQ calculation upon this, and keep in mind, this is just fuel cost. We're not calculating operational costs or anything here. Um, so this has a overall cost of about 66.6 million, um, which comes out to a levelized cost of 5.42 um, per megawatt hour. And 
and uh, Joey will cover our next. So this is our uh, cycle extension loading pattern. Uh, as you can see, it is an L3P design, has the ring of fire uh, around the or near the periphery of the core and a checkerboard pattern uh, in the interior. Um, it has 72 feet of sem or 77 feet assemblies, 72 once burns, and uh, eight twice burns. Um, we use a variety of GAD patterns, and you can't see the enrichments, but all the core is 4.95% uh, enriched to try to get the max um, length out of the cycle we possibly could, um, except for the center assembly, which is 4.7% uh, rich, which was uh, done for peaking concerns. So as you can see, um, all our limits, again, were met uh, with the FQ and F delta H peaking nor, uh, near the uh, middle of the cycle due to the burn up of our 8% uh, GAD. Um, there's a little uh, other peaks kind of near the beginning, which is due to the burnups of our two and four and six percent uh, GADs. Uh, and again, we were just barely over our boron uh, concentration by uh, 15, just for about a one effective full power day, and uh, we met our, our burnup limit. Um, so a as I was saying, uh, we were just barely over the, uh, the boron limit with uh, 16 <coughs> 1,615 uh, uh, ppm. Um, this cycle went to uh, 528 effective full power days uh, and had a negative moderate temperature coefficient of BOC of a negative 12 PCM per degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and as you can see, uh, in the beginning of the cycle, the power was concentrated primarily in the ring of fire where we would expect it to be. And then as the uh, cycle progressed, well, th this is a, a plot of our um, F delta H kind of showing a, a, um, a map of the core power. Uh, it centralized to the uh, checkerboard region and uh, stayed there for the uh, remainder of the cycle. And uh, the cycle had a uh, cost of 86 million. Um, the primary cost came from the uh, purchase of the, uh, the, the raw materials, the yellow cake, and um, the uh, enrichment process. And uh, this resulted in a levelized cost of electricity, um, just accounting for, again, the fuel cost of um, $6.59 per megawatt hour. And uh, Don will talk about our two-year cycle. So this is our two-year cycle design. Um, and the unique thing about this is we, we now took um, enrichments up to 6.95%. Um, as you can see here, the picture doesn't show very well, but the red colors, we actually have an, a ring around the outside of 6.45%, and this second inner ring is actually 6.2% um, enriched fuel, and then we have 6.45% um, enriched fuel again. Um, and we change these enrichments to, put to um, uh, meet our peaking limits. Additionally, each of these assemblies has various GAD patterns ranging anywhere from 2 to 8% two to, um, gadolinium in the assemblies. Um, the cycle behavior over time, uh, we can see that we do, um, as the burn, initially in the FQ um, plot, as the low enriched gadolinium burn, um, burns off out, we do have um, an increase in peaking. Um, however, we do meet our limit. Um, we are right at the limit, uh, and we um, confirm with Framtone that this is um, okay um, to go with. Additionally, um, our F delta H um, is well below our F delta H limit, and our boron uh, meets our uh, 1600 ppm boron limit. Um, over time, you can see um, as the initially our power um, is focused more towards the, um, I guess the uh, the um, bottom over here and then the top over there, and then as this it, along the cycle, as a low enriched gadolinium burns out we actually see a higher power um, in this um, center area of the quarter core symmetry. Um, we designed this cycle out to 682 full power days, um, and then all of our other limits um, were, we were met with a negative uh, moderator temperature coefficient of 15.02 PCM per degrees Fahrenheit.
No pinwheel of death. Everything's good. Hello everybody, we are the last group and we are the BWX 300 load falling Cape Billies team. I'm Anna, this is Matt, followed by Ben, Andy, Netra, and in the back is Gray. And so our project is in partnership with General Electric Hitachi, who is currently designing a 300 megawatt natural circulating boiling water reactor. Natural circulation implies that there are no reactor coolant pumps or jet pumps to push flow through the reactor core. So the goal of our project was to analyze their reactor for its load following capabilities. So load following is important because it changes the operations a power plant has. And so as you know, electricity demand changes constantly on a daily basis, and this requires certain power plants to change their output to match the demand. And with the additional addition of renewable energies on the market, these changes can be quite drastic and occur steep ramping breaches shown here. We decided to analyze the California Independent System operating grid for the largest change in demand in 2018 because it's an excellent example of how these renewable resources changes the grid demand. And this graph is shown here is the top green line is the indication of the actual demand for that day, but with the addition of renewable resources, that demand has shifted downward with the largest change in that demand occurring toward the middle of the day. And so these um, load following, um, load following with the plants produces extra operational as well as equipment challenges. And so for our project, we actually designed a reactor similar to, B to the BWX 300 in order to showcase our results and to avoid problems with proprietary information. We analyzed our reactor for its inherent load following capabilities, meaning how well it can change the reactor power in um, which changes in turbine demand. Then we also analyzed two electric and one thermal medium to load follow instead of reactor, which allows our reactor to um, operate in a constant base load. Then we analyzed the um, viability of our options through our economic analysis. So beginning with the reactor load following itself, we had to do three steps. First, we had to initialize a reactor design Next, we had to develop a time-dependent systems code to analyze our model, and finally, iterate on our initial design to make the reactor more suitable for load following. So we had to start somewhere. We decided to start with the ESBWR, which stands for the Economic Simplified Boiling Water Reactor, which was a natural circulating BWR developed by GE. And we were able to scale it down by initially starting with the average heat flux, and by assuming identical fuel performance in the same geometry we're able to narrow it down to the second equation, which states that for 20% of the heat input, there'd be 20% of the fuel assemblies. Shown on the left is the RPV of the ESBWR, and their core height was 10 feet. And for our, one of our main desi design decisions, we stretched the core height from 10 feet to 12 and a half feet. And that corresponds to about 16% of the fuel assemblies that you would need. And on the right, whenever we developed our time-dependent systems code, we, had to, we had essentially had to break it up into nodes. And our model contained 11 nodes and 12 junctions. And all of the nodes can be modeled as single inlet, single outlet, except for the steam dome, which can be treated as a manifold. So as was mentioned, in order to analyze the load following capabilities of this reactor, we developed our own time-dependent systems code. And since we're looking at load following maneuvers, we needed the code to be able to handle these transient analyses. And so we started with an outer time loop that progressed all of the calculations. And so these outlines on the left and the right show where each of the physics models falls in the algorithm as well as what variables are passed from one to another. And so when we start with this time loop, the first change to a reactor system due to a load following maneuver is a change in steam demand, which for us is a surrogate for the change in the electrical output. Uh, from the steam demand, we can uh, imply a change in reactivity that's necessary to meet the new demand, and that's passed on to the neutron kinetics model. Here we calculate a new neutron precursor concentration, or C in the top right outline, and a new neutron power. This is then passed to the heat transfer physics model where we calculate a new core thermal power, and then we use that to calculate the new fluid properties of the system. The fluid dynamics um, are special in that they've required a convergence loop, uh, which is characterized by this GIF in the middle of the slide, and we'll get into the reasons for that um, in a couple slides. 
And then the last step of the algorithm was to use the controllers we built into the systems code. Uh, and these just ensure that we're maintaining certain specific system parameters. And then this loop iterates until the full transient has been analyzed. So as been mentioned, um, the first thing that we give the system in order to change the power level is a steam demand. This gives the system a reference steam flow rate um, that causes an error signal between the actual steam flow rate and the reference steam flow rate. Um, this provides the system with a reactivity demand, which is then tried to be met by moving control rods. Um, as you can see on the right hand side, or your left hand side, that there's a steam demand given to the system. This steam demand curve includes benchmark ramp rates from the ABWR as well as the ESBWR. Um, and this steam demand then yields the control rod reactivity insertions um, shown on the left hand side. So the control rods move, but there's also more reactivity feedbacks included in the calculation. So we performed, we solved the one group point kinetics equations um, to include the reactivity feedbacks from void, um, fuel temperature, xenon, and control rods. So as the fuel temperature goes up, the negative reactivity from fuel also increases as, and the other reactivity coefficients also provide their feedback. Um, and those are calculated every loop to manage the reactivity balance and therefore change power level. And so once we calculate that new neutron or fuel power, we then have to calculate the core thermal power. And there's a time lag associated with the thermal constant of the fuel. And so these are the equations we use to calculate the core thermal power. Um, P shown in the top equation is the new neutron power. And the reason we're showing these equations is just to show that we assumed an average fuel temperature of 1200 degrees Fahrenheit for this calculation. And this is a plot of this uh, lag in demand. Uh, so we can see that the steam demand is the black dashed line and that after about 200 to 300 seconds, the neutron power and the core thermal power uh, fall to meet the steam demand. And then to solve the fluid dynamics, we looked at mass and energy balances in each of the 11 nodes of the core schematic that Matt showed earlier. We also looked at a momentum equation integrated around the full RPV flow loop and then a momentum relationship between system and condenser pressure. Uh, we solved these equations for each of the 12 junction velocities as well as the change in system pressure. And the reason we needed that convergence loop is because this is a system of nonlinear equations in velocity. And so the way we solved is by linearizing using a Taylor series expansion and then converging on the solution using a Newton iteration. And so this GIF shows the process of this. Uh, you can see that you linearize the plot at a certain X value. You figure out what the zero is associated with that line. And then you use that intercept as the next guess for the X value. And this loops until you find the root of this plot. And so this shows how we actually converged on the correct values for those fluid equations. And then we call on the controllers that we have in the system. There are three separate controllers. The first helps with the convergence of the Newton iteration. The second maintains a constant level in the downcomer of the BWR. This is a three element controller that looks at the mismatch between the current level and the reference level, as well as the mismatch between steam, fl steam flow and feed flow. And then the last controller, which we have a plot of here, is a pressure controller, where we modulate the turbine control valve position to follow the steam demand in order to keep the pressure of the system constant. Okay, so essentially we were able to model our reactor system to follow the steam demand that we provided. Um, so if you see on the left, we were able to meet the benchmark ramp rates with some delay, so the red being the um, steam output and the blue being the steam demand, um, there are some time lag between that. Um, that is kind of dictated by, or in our system that's dictated by the reactivity insertion rates of the control rods that we impose. Um, and if you look on the left, um, as Anna mentioned, we scaled the, or she talked about the CISO grid um, is our most limiting case and that's what we were going to design to. So this is a scaled version of that so that our peak demand is at our 
300 megawatts electric four hour plant. And over, we spread that across a 24 hour period, um, starting at full power and ending at full power. We are able to meet those transients. The same time lag is um, ap apparent in the, in following the CISO grid. You just can't see it because it's more zoomed out over a larger period of time. Okay, and then given that we were able to model the system, um, we wanted to optimize what we already had because we started with the design, but a lot of the decisions were arbitrary and we didn't optimize any of the parameters. So we wanted to kind of minimize the RPV size, um, but stay within thermal limits. So we wanted to get a CPR of about 1.3 um, while minimizing size and fuel as we could. Um, so we were able to get 1.32 by changing the amount of fuel bundles in the core and changing reactor pressure vessel sizes, the inner and outer vessel, the chimney height, some of the flow areas. Um, and this resulted in about 25% of the ESBWR bundles um, being 277 and an average linear heat rate of 3.16 kilowatt per foot. Um, in addition to following an electrical demand using the reactor, we also looked into following the electric demand by keeping the power level constant and using energy storage methods, as Anna described earlier, and Netra will take over from you. As mentioned before, uh, we have also analyzed an additional uh, load following method. Um, here, these are the options that provides clean carbon-free alternatives, which allows the reactor to uh, operate in base load. Uh, our first option provides peaking and, uh, peaking and storage capabilities. Here, the plant will load follow at 450 megawatt electric, which is 50% of reactor's rated power. The peaking component uh, is very beneficial for the small grids as it provides a buffer to when starting large loads. At the same time, utility can take advantage of profit from peak power pricing. Our second and third option provides only storage capabilities. Here, the uh, reactor will load follow operate at, um, sorry. Here, the reactor will operate uh, above the demand curve and will constantly add uh, energy to our storage system. These, op these options are uh, simple, uh, these options provide simple designs and uh, provides uh, less equipment to manage. Uh, our first option utilizes fuel cells and hydrogen electrolyzers. Fuel cells are devices that converts chemical reaction between uh, fluid into electricity. Our f design uses polymer exchange uh, membrane fuel cells because of high efficiency, high power density, quick startup, and uses hydrogen gas as their fuel. They are made up of electrolytes surrounded by anode and cathode on either sides. Uh, at anode, fuel uh, is split into protons and electrons producing electricity. Protons and electrons are merged into with oxygen at cathode and produce water as their byproduct. Hydrogen electrolyzers are devices that uses uh, electric current to split water molecules. They work very fim similar to the uh, fuel cells but in reverse direction. At anode, the water molecules are split into hydrogen and oxygen ions. The hydrogen ions are sent to the cathode and are collected as pure hydrogen gas. This hydrogen gas can be uh, used as fuel for our fuel cells or can be sold on the market for other purposes. This is the schematic for, uh, for our electrical integration with the two devices. We, have install we can install a logic controller and which places the, either of the devices on the grid depending on the demand. When the reactor under supplies, it will uh, align the fuel cells on and it would provide the extra energy. And when the reactor over supplies this, it would align the electrolyzers on the grid and it would use the excess energy to produce hydrogen gas. So in order to determine how many fuel cells and electrolyzers we need, we had to scale down the California grid. Shown here is the scaling for our first option. Notice how it has a peaking component as well as a storage component, and the reactor is operating at a constant 300 megawatt base load. We 
correlated the peak of the demand curve, which is the top curve, to the 450 megawatts electric. And with the addition of the renewables, our actual operating um, zones have shifted to where our reactor is supplying more energy to storage versus operating in a peaking unit. For our second our third and third options, our scaling is similar, except that the base load correlates to the top of the demand curve, and our reactor will only be supplying power to the grid in storage. So here is, is the schematic for our second option. It's the integration of hydrogen electrolyzers only. Here, the reactor will only be supplying power to the grid as well as the electrolyzers. For our third option, we decided to analyze a thermal energy storage system. This system was originally developed by Connor Frick and Dr. Doster, and it was meant to be coupled with a pressurized water reactor. However, this uh, system can also be adapted for our boiling water reactor, as well as scaled to our size. Here, steam is diverted from the main steam header upstream of the turbine control valve. This allows the turbine bypass valve to keep the pressure in the steam header constant whenever the turbine control valve changes with changes in electric demand. The diverted steam is sent through an intermediate heat exchanger where its energy is extracted before being sent back to the main condenser. The extracted energy is collected inside of a hot tank and can be used for heat input for building heat or desalinization plants or other heating purposes. And so, so I'm going to talk about economics a little bit. Um, so we've obviously talked about many different options for load following here. So we want to uh, compare them and see how they stack up with each other. Uh, now we use the levelized cost of electricity, or LCOE, which some other groups have used. If you're not sure what it is, it's the price at which a system has to sell the electricity it produces in order to offset its costs uh, over a given period of time. So we have it calculated here for several different options. It's also broken up in terms of fuel costs, operation and maintenance costs, and capital costs and there's a range of expected values shown by the error bars as well. Uh, on the far left, you've got the BWX300 reactor in base load and load following. As you can see, load following operation does have an inherent additional cost. Uh, in the middle, those are our three uh, energy storage options that we've talked about, and obviously there is uh, further additional costs associated with the additional infrastructure for those technologies. On the right here, we have some industry comparisons. We have an AP1000 reactor for a high-end comparison. And on the low end, we've used combined cycle natural gas, which is currently one of the cheaper options out there, uh, both with and without a carbon tax. So the, that combined cycle gas is, is around where we like to be to be competitive. And obviously, uh, with those energy storage technologies, we're not quite there yet. But uh, this is basically what it would take in order for us to get down to those combined cycle numbers. Uh, just the percent decrease in price of the fuel cell and electrolyzer technology that would be necessary to match the uh, calculated LCOE for combined cycle gas, both with and without a carbon tax. Obviously, if there's a carbon tax implemented, it becomes much easier to be economically competitive with that option. Uh, but even without, uh, you're talking about you know a 40 to 50 percent decrease in price. Uh, in the long term, it's very feasible as uh, this technology continues to be more widely produced and implemented. Uh, production costs will go down. Now another option we've talked about is uh, coupling nuclear power with hydrogen production. This is basically a little snapshot of what kind of LCOEs you can expect with this option. Now it's very dependent upon both the selling price of hydrogen and the amount of hydrogen that you're selling. Um, and obviously hydrogen, the market price of hydrogen can vary significantly depending upon what kind of, of, of market or environment that you're in. Uh, we need it to be about at least $5 per kilogram uh, at a selling point in order to be competitive, and we've also probably need to be selling uh, most of what we're producing. So there has to be a situation for this to be economically viable where we can sell a lot of hydrogen and sell it at, at a desirable price. Um, so obviously it's not the most, you know, we can't confidently say that it's a, a very economically competitive option right now. But again, as, as costs and technology uh, decrease for the electrolyzers, uh, we believe it can be more competitive in the future. So in conclusion for this project, uh, we've analyzed load following mainly for the BWRX300 reactor using the systems code, but also for several energy storage methods as well. And we've determined that load following performance uh, for the BWRX300 reactor is definitely possible, uh, but the e economic feasibility of it is still in doubt as of this moment. Um, so our future work 
Uh, we'd like to continue to develop our steam code that we've created uh, to inter analyze reactor transients associated with load falling. We'd like to implement more uh, realistic reactor geometry specifically, uh, as well as reactor design iterations for optimum load falling behavior. And, ad and ad additionally, excuse me, uh, we'd like to have more safety analysis capabilities. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge Dr. Hayes, who's our advisor for this project, uh, as well as Krista Dahlgren, our industry contact from GE Hitachi. And we'd also like to thank Dr. Doster for his help with the systems code. Those are references. Okay. Questions? We should have questions, yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, for two of the storage options, you mentioned storage only. There's no such thing as just storage only, because they have to be discharged at some point. Correct. Uh, Questions? Questions? Well, let us thank the group. And this actually concludes the oral presentation. And I will get Lisa to talk about, you know, some logistics as we will be moving to another location just inside here, another room for the posters and for the dinner. So come over, Lisa, please. Okay, so if I can have all of the students stand in the back in two rows so I can take a, a group picture of the students. Um, and then also, uh, if I can have all of the advisory members and mentors go first to uh, the other location, the Lux Ballroom.